اهلا وسهلا فيكم متابعينا بحلقه جديده من برنامج يلا بحلقه اليوم رح نحكي مع المدير التنفيذي لمعهد اتفاقيات سلام الابراهيميه اري لايتستون اللي شغل منصب كبير مستشاري السفير الامريكيه السابق في اسرائيل ديفيد فريدمان وكان لاري دور هام في الوصول لاتفاقيات اسلام الابراهيميه التاريخيه وبهي الحلقه رح نحكي معه عن الدور الحالي لاتفاقيات اسلام الابراهيميه والتقرير الجديد للمعهد اللي عم بيديره حول الفوائد الاقتصاديه الكبرى لهذه الاتفاقيات على الدول المشاركه فيها كما وعن تاثير مجزره السابع من اكتوبر والحرب بين اسرائيل وحماس على هذه الاتفاقيات والى اين نتجه من هنا للمعرفه اكثر عن كل هذه القضايا خليكم معنا بهي الحلقه من برنامج يلا I just wanted to talk about the October 7th in terms of the Iranian regime's involvement. There is a lot of different analysis based on evidence and of course the long history of the Iranian regime funding, arming and training Hamas. So the conventional wisdom that a lot of people are basically saying now that this was an attempt by the Iranian regime to prevent an imminent peace between Israel and Saudi Arabia. Do you agree with that? And do you think the regime in Iran succeeded in reversing the momentum that was created by the Abraham Accords? Iran and its proxies don't need an excuse. Iran's leaders and their proxies, Hamas, Hezbollah, the Houthis, spend 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, plotting and attempting to destroy Israel, the Jewish people, the West, and the United States of America. That's what they do. They are professional terrorists who hate freedom. Were they trying to stop normalization with Saudi? Maybe. But if it wasn't normalization with Saudi and they thought they could accomplish in a October 7th again for no other reason, they would have done it. And if there was peace with Saudi Arabia tomorrow, they would do it. And if Saudi announced that they will never have peace with Israel, they would do it because this is what they do. Terrorists are terrorists are terrorists. They need no excuse. They are the worst part of humanity and they need to be isolated and ultimately destroyed. And is Iran behind this? Iran is 100% behind this. How do I know that? Because they tell you they're behind this. This is what they fund. This is what they support. This is what they want to have happen. And if you were to ask the Iranian leadership, did they like October 7th? They will say no. They will say it wasn't successful enough. And on that note, I do want to go back to the what's happening in our universities and campuses across the United States and other countries in Europe now. I was born in Damascus, Syria. I've witnessed and saw what has those um, very evil uh, terrorist groups have done to many countries around the Middle East. And I know their ideology, and they do want to kill the Jewish people. They want to destroy Israel. That's very... Uh, they're very clear about that. Uh, and what's really, for me, heartbreaking is to see that American students are basically buying into this. They are either in denial or basically are okay with those slogans, like from the river to the sea, which means the destruction of Israel. Tell us a little bit more about your perspective. What do you think our audience should know about what's happening today? Number one is we should know that there's an enormous difference in between what's happening in Europe and what's happening in the United States of America. Europe, as the foreign minister of the UAE, United Arab Emirates, uh, Sheikh Abdullah said, you've taken in, in the name of non-racism, people who want to destroy your country from within. There will come a day that we will see far more radical extremists and terrorists coming out of Europe because of lack of decision-making, trying to be politically correct, or assuming that they know the Middle East and they know Islam and they know the others far better than we do. And I'm, I'm sorry, but that's pure ignorance. The radical Islamic world has succeeded in a great deal in parts of Europe to be able to go ahead and make this called mainstream not only politics, but culture within Europe. Mm -hmm. And that's terrifying. And I don't know if that's reversible. 
I really do not know if it's reversible. But your audience should have enormous amount of confidence of what they're seeing in the United States of America is a very small blip. It's a dangerous blip. I'm not minimizing the blip, but it is a very small blip. This is not America. These are not the vast majority of American students. It's not even a majority of American students. It's a tiny minority of radical leftists who have picked this issue as their issue of today. They had another issue last year. They'll have another issue in a year from now. The difference here, and this is really important for all of your audience to know, there is no separation between the protesters who hate Israel and the protesters who hate America. They are one and the same. And here's why I'll tell you that there's actually very good news here. The American higher education system is broken. It's not sort of broken, it's fully broken. The faculty and administration of so many of these universities, sort of the more elite and well thought of, the more broken they are, don't live in a real world. These are the people who said, let's defund the police, and then we're surprised when crime rises. And I think what's going to happen from this horrendous situation that we've seen on college campuses is that Americans everywhere are going to look and say, wait, we funded these places? We pay for students and universities to teach their students how to hate America? Why am I doing that with my tax dollars? And I think we're going to look at an opportunity to reform the higher education institution and imagine what America would look like if higher education actually taught patriotism and love of the United States of America instead of the garbage that they spend a lot of time teaching now. You are a man of faith, so you must see God's hands in the trajectory of events in the last few years. Could you share that perspective with our audience? What are the odds that the United States of America, which is literally the most blessed country in the history of the world, would choose to stand against most of the rest of the world and to support the state of Israel? And you have to ask yourself a question. Is that intentional or is it unintentional? And what I mean by that is, is that if you look at the rest of the world, what is you, what is the state of Israel's superpower? It's that the United States, regardless of Republicans or Democrats, have stood with the state of Israel. And I have to tell you, I think a great degree of the blessing that the United States of America has received from God has been because the United States of America has stood against the overwhelming majority of people on this planet and said, we will stand with Israel. And you know what? We learned something very important. Do I really care what the head of Cuba says, or the head of China says, or the head of North Korea says, or the head of Iran says, are these supposed to be our moral beacons of light? The United States of America, because of where it is and who it is, has an obligation, a moral obligation, I would argue a religious obligation, to lead the world in that which is considered appropriate and just. And this is something important. People get nervous about saying this. Being strong is not something to be embarrassed about. Being strong is something you should be proud of. Being strong and being feared by your enemies is something that you should be incredibly proud of and do not surrender that for a single minute. Because here's what happens. When the United States of America takes a step back from world leadership, it's not replaced by Sweden, and it's not replaced by Costa Rica, and it's not even replaced by some of our best friends in Kazakhstan. It's replaced by Russia and China and Iran. When we do not lead, when we are not strong, the bad guys win, and we cannot let the bad guys win. It's not fair for my kids, it's not fair for your family, it's not fair for the good people of the United States of America and the rest of the people who understand what a great country this is. What are your thoughts on the religious coexistence in the Middle East? I know that it's probably not shown as much um, on social media because people still are afraid, but you do see a change in tone and the readiness that is happening. So if you can tell us about your own uh, opinion on that. Sure. There are two wars that are happening simultaneously. We're watching one happen in Gaza. We're watching another happen on our college campus. The leftists on our college campus hate anything that has to do with God. They hate anything that has to do with morality and values, because if you can destroy morality, if you can destroy values, you can destroy the United States of America and you can destroy the West. So you have one war by, by, by people who hate anything that has to do with morality and God, and that's being fought from the radical left. And then you have another war that's being fought by radical Islam. I am not Muslim, but I have many, many good friends who are. 
who will tell you that what happened on October 7th, there is no Allah, there is no God that would condone, support, recommend, or bless those activities. And the people of Islam, the people of Judaism, the people of Christianity, and all the myriad other strong religions that are there need to fight against both of these together. We need to fight against the radicals who will tell us that our children shouldn't be raised in faith. And the other extreme will be here to tell you that our God will not let us coexist. Our God will demand that we kill each other. Our God will demand that we destroy everybody who is not like us. And this war is going to be won in two ways, raising our children in the appropriate way and reaching out to our neighbors and being able to be together with them. And we will win this war because we are on the right side of this war. You spend a lot of time in the Middle East, North Africa, and the MENA region. What's your most memorable and surprising experience? My most surprising experience was when people discovered that I represent the United States of America and also keep strict kosher. So the amount of times that I would walk into somebody's house and they're like, but you're not Israeli. I'm like, that's correct. Because in the United States of America, you can be anything you want to be, including an Orthodox Jew who represents the United States of America. And people were so nervous, including myself, at the beginning, would other people treat me appropriately if I walked in as an Orthodox Jew representing the United States of America? And I will tell you, to every single example that I had, mm -hmm. I was embraced more because I was proud of who I was. Not a single person that I met shied away from that. So that was one. Number two is, I don't know if you've been to Saudi recently, but with the last two trips I've had to Riyadh, the energy in the air is electric. And the enthusiasm about building a Middle East that will be better tomorrow than it was yesterday is contagious. And if you look at Dubai and Tel Aviv and Riyadh, you're looking at a region that when they work together can change the entire world. And when you look at other places like Gaza City, and I won't name the other countries because I don't want to embarrass anybody right now, and they look, they should have a decision to make. Do they want to look more like Kabul and Tehran? Or do they want to look like Tel Aviv, Riyadh, and Abu Dhabi? And my guess is they want to look more like Tel Aviv, Riyadh, and Abu Dhabi. And because of channels like yours, there are young men and young women growing up across the MENA region who know that that is within their possibility, and they will demand that from their leaders, and their leaders will have to deliver. Yes, and that would make a better future for all of us, including the Palestinians. Absolutely. Absolutely. I wanted to ask you, what are you hopeful about? When you told me what your name meant, and for people who don't know that your name means uh, optimism or hope, okay. I have to tell you, I believe that the Bible commands us to be optimistic. Look, I, I think TikTok is horrendous. I'm not a big fan of Instagram. I don't know. All of these things I think are terrible, and I think they rot your mind. But there's one benefit to them. There's one benefit, that the kid growing up who never thought that he would be able to connect to somebody else in this region, that the person who literally lives 10 miles from them is their enemy, will learn that they're not their enemy. And the person who's brought up who thinks that they're being trained in order to blow up buses or to go kidnap and rape women is going to discover that he or she can grow up to be a doctor or a physician or an investment banker if they want to do that, or even a lawyer, God forbid. They're going to grow up and they're going to see that they can build far better and far more successfully than they can destroy. And as bad as the leaders are in this region, and there's some terrible leaders there, technology will defeat those leaders because technology and time are undefeated and corrupt leaders lose. Sometimes it takes longer, but they lose. And whether that's the mullahs in Iran or the horrendous leadership of the Palestinian Authority in Hamas, there's a better future and that future is in the Middle East. Thank you so much for this very inspirational interview. Thank you.